Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for gathering us together under the blood of your Son and in your house uh, to celebrate you together, uh, to praise you, to bring glory to your name, and to be rejuvenated and be sent out into the world to uh, just tell them everyone who you are. I pray that as we uh, come before your throne, you will give us the right attitude and clean heart, uh, and just to be attentive to you, to hear your voice today, and what you want us to learn about you and about ourselves. It is in Jesus' precious name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Children. And children of church can leave. Everybody stand so you can walk on the floor.
It starts off with Genesis 46, 3 and 4. And it says, I am God, the God of your father. Do not fear to go down to Egypt, for I will make you a great nation there. I will go down with you to Egypt, and I will also surely bring you up again. God is with us. I imagine that most of you are reading these words already know that, although most of us believe it at some level. I'm not sure how many of us actually embrace it. So just for a minute, I want you to take a moment to feel the impact of that phrase. I want you to ponder at what it means for God to be with you. Now, maybe you believe this when life is good, when you're relaxing on the beach or eating at your favorite restaurant. It's easy to believe that God is with you in such moments. This principle remains true, however, no matter when we say it, regardless of whether we feel it, frustrated at work, encouraged by kind words, or devastated by tragedy, God is with us. This doesn't mean that God always creates a smooth path for us or gives us an easy life. It means that whatever we experience, our amazing Heavenly Father will be with us every step of the way. I find it so encouraging that God is not simply way off in the distance, somewhere doing something else. He is actually with us. Maybe you are hurting deeply today. God is with you. Maybe you are battling discouragement. God is with you. Maybe you are lonely. God is still with you. Perhaps you are fighting a terrible disease. God is with you. Perhaps you have recently lost a loved one. God is with you. The reward of our faithfulness to God is the realization that he is and always will be with us. His faithful presence carries us through. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. So Heavenly Father, we gather here to take communion. Remember the sacrifice that you sent your son to die for us. Help us to take this communion with open hearts, with love, Son's most precious name we pray.
straight. Father, we know that what's straight is an honor comes from you. And that promotion comes not from the east, not from the west, not from the north, not from the south, but from you, Lord. We gave you thanks for the many ways you have provided for us this week, the past weeks, and the way you provide for us in the weeks to come. Help us to surrender our hearts to you as we surrender our offering to you now, we pray in Jesus' name. Pretty rough a lot of the time. Am I right or am I right? Oh, I know. Uh, 
And about uh, the year 2007, there was a book published, uh, actually with some of those perceptions, not necessarily from the media, but from people outside the church. And that book was called Unchristian. And there's a couple quick passages I'd like to read you today before we get started. Um, but it's from the uh, Christian research group Barna. Uh, and George Barna, uh, who heads it up, uh, an evangelical, wrote this book after he was challenged by a friend to kind of compile the data on how people perceive not just Christian, you know, Christians, but Christianity, how they perceive that. Um, and he says here on page 15, using the lens of the careful scientific research we conducted, I um, please notice that um, it, this text reflects outsiders' most common reaction to the faith. They think Christians no longer represent what Jesus had in mind, that Christianity in our society is not what it was meant to be. For many people, the Christian faith looks weary and threadbare. They admit they have a hard time actually seeing Jesus because of all the negative baggage that now surrounds him. And one outsider from Mississippi made this blunt observation. Christianity has become bloated with blind followers who would rather repeat slogans than actually feel true compassion and care. Christianity has become marketed and streamlined into a juggernaut of fear-mongering that has lost its own heart. And that may offend some of us. Uh, may feel a little bit perturbed by that, especially because it seems like a demonization of who we are. And obviously not everybody is that image. But I think this morning as we reflect on that, we do have to come to the realization that Christianity has an image problem in the United States. One of the issues that we have is often how people not just perceive us, but perceive Jesus. And that's why that's just so important. It's not just about facts and opinions. It's about removing barriers to people coming to know Christ. But instead of staying in facts and opinions, uh, stats and opinions and perspectives, I'd like to actually look at what Scripture has to say about it this morning. So if you'd like to follow along, we'll be going into 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 through 21. Uh, and I'll be in the NIV, so if you want to follow along directly, uh, that's the uh, one I'll be in. And as we open up, it's important to uh, catch the title of this. If you have a, a Bible that gives you a title of the specific section, it says the Ministry of Reconciliation. And while that's a pretty good summary of what it is, there's some other things that are going on here. Especially in this time in uh, the Corinthian church, Paul was dealing with an issue of how people perceive the other. Uh, Jews and Greeks relating to other people in the church. Divisions that are having fights because of how people saw each other inside and outside of the church. So Paul is uh, opening an argument here about who he is, but it really has a larger statement about who we're supposed to be, how we're supposed to relate to other people, uh, and the message that we're supposed to give. So it opens up in verse 14. For the Christ's love compels us, because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. And it's so important to start there because this is exactly what Paul's argument is based on. What compels us is not love of Christ, but the love of Christ to us. Not our love for Jesus, but Jesus' love for us. Jesus' love for us is supposed to compel us forward to do something, to do something differently, to live beyond ourselves. Um, and it's so important to clarify as well um, Paul is stating that we must partic uh, participate in Christ's death. So he's meaning living sacrificially. That's why he says in verse 15, we should no longer live for ourselves. Because Jesus died, we die every day to who we are. It's no longer us, but Jesus who lives in us. Jesus who died for us and was raised for us. And therefore, we no longer live for ourselves. And it's so important here, because the meaning of that spe those specific verses dictates what happens throughout the rest of the passage. In other words, if we have accepted the love of God, we're not our own anymore. And we've said, said before, it's other places in Scripture, we're bought. We're not our own anymore. No longer can we be who we were. We have a new identity and a new purpose. <coughs> Christ's love compelled us. We no longer live for ourselves. And often overlooked are the next two verses. And I may stay here for a little bit extra this morning, but Verses 16 to 17 read thus. So from now on, 
We regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, the new is here. Now, in the words that Paul actually used, I'll be honest, I can't pronounce it, it's still all Greek to me. Um, but the words that Paul uses, uh, you may have it in your Bible as uh, perceiving according to the flesh uh, or um, by a human perspective. Um, often, I, I really believe that this verse is often overlooked in this narrative. Uh, because often, because Paul is talking about what our ministry is, it's easy to overlook the, who the ministry is to. Um, and Paul says, we no longer regard anyone from a worldly point of view because we once regarded Christ from a worldly point of view, but we no longer do. And why is that? It seems such a weird thing to say. We saw Christ from a human perspective. But we have to look at Scripture. Did the apostles always get it right? Did they always know who Jesus really was? They saw Jesus the teacher. They saw Jesus the prophet, Jesus the man. But they didn't know who Jesus the Christ was until after he was resurrected. When they become new, after he had died, that died for their sins, and they were saved, they saw things from a new perspective. Who they were had fundamentally changed. It was already in process, but they completely changed their worldview. And we all know that it's still a process. Peter still had trouble getting you know, in touch with the Gentiles and the Greeks. Um, and we know that uh, even, you know, even Paul uh, may have had a bit of a, a headache trying to move from speaking to the Jews and to a new people. So worldviews take time to change. But it's so important, we no longer regard anyone from a worldly point of view. Because though we once saw Jesus as human, he's so much more than that. And though we see people around us in the way that the world sees them, we're supposed to see them in a different way. So the way that uh, people might interact, language, it has to die, it has to be Reaffected. It has. We have to change how we perceive other people, and uh, that's important. We'll come back to that point here uh, after verses 18 and 19, and this is where the crux of the passage is. All this is from God, who reconciled us to Himself through Christ, and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to Himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. So Jesus, as an ambassador of God's reconciliation to us, did not see us as we would often describe the world, and maybe sometimes ourselves. And so, have scripture for just a second. Some words that we might use to describe people outside the church are sometimes the words that people outside the church would often use to describe each other and us. How many times are we on the road and we describe somebody as a jerk and call them an idiot because they're driving recklessly? How many times do we see somebody on the street that we don't like and we call somebody a slut or a hooker and we say words that maybe describe who a person is but they're not the words that Jesus would use? And so even as we reflect on the words that people use about us and the perspectives and the way that they see us, it's what's developing in this passage is this thought that because we're new, because we're different, because we're like Christ, the way that we relate to other people is different, and therefore we change our own language. What's happening in 18 is that all this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ, and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. We may describe people as sinful, lost, unbelieving. Uh, I hope that none of us would use the word pagan or sinner, you know, out in public and say, oh, what a sinner. And most likely none of us do. But it's not just our words directly, but our thoughts and the way we relate to people. It affects how we ultimately interact with them. And if Jesus didn't do that, then neither should we. In fact, the message that we're uh, given is not exactly um, what it would seem to be on the face. It's not just about treating people differently in a different care, but pointing people to who Jesus is and removing the barriers, making it easier for people to be reconciled to who God is. Um, 
And uh, maybe this is, seems like a bit of a more of a preachier sermon than what I usually do. Uh, but this has been on my heart for a very long time that the world perceives us in a way that is negative because of the message that we're sending. And the reason why verses 18 and 19 are so important is because this is what the message is supposed to be. And so let's break that down. Reconciliation here in Scripture um, is different from, uh, you might have heard it before, justification or being purchased, uh, redeemed. It's on our side. Being redeemed is being bought. Being justified is like you're justified in court and now you're okay. But we should all be familiar with reconciliation because that's broken relationships. Be to be reconciled is to be put back together again, to be uh, related in a new way, to be repaired, and to be put back together like a puzzle that's been you know, scattered, and now it's back into the image that it's supposed to be. And in a lot of ways, we're all broken, right? We can definitely agree with that. The world sees us as broken because we are. We see the world as broken because they are. But what God wants to do is put all that puzzle back together. And so the message that we send is not that the world is broken, but that Jesus has come to put it back together again. It's not just little jigsaw pieces everywhere. Jesus is trying to put that back where it belongs, trying to put the world to rights, put it where it is. And so that's the message that we're supposed to send, that God has entrusted with us, because that's the message that Jesus brought. Because Jesus never said the world was perfect. He forgave their sins, but he never said that everyone was good. He spoke truth where it was in a way that made sense, that told people how they could be fixed, how things could be put back. And so one of the most important things is to see ourselves as that ambassador, as that message, as our the core of who we're supposed to be. God didn't just reconcile us to him. He's motivating us to live for him. As I said earlier, when he died, he motivated us to live for him by proclaiming this message authentically and abundantly to other people. Regardless of who they are, where they are, what we think of them, or who we are, what we feel like. But because this is who we're supposed to be. Because now that we've been reborn in who Jesus is, because of his salvation, we've been entrusted with this message to bring it to other people. Uh, and it's so very important that uh, we learn that language. Uh, it's a bit faster than what I usually do, but we're moving on to verses 20 and 21 where it says, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And this is where I really want to settle for our application. Um, and we really have to start with a question on this. What is an ambassador? Because he says we are Christ's ambassadors, but what is that? What does that really mean? And we should be really somewhat familiar with it because we have ambassadors to different countries or policies. But it said in a commentary I was reading that it is required of ambassadors that they stay constantly in touch with the countries they represent and they convey the views of their countries to the host country. It is also their duty to persuade the host country to buy the views of the home country on any given issue to relay the views of the host country to the home country so as to promote mutual understanding. And to summarize, ambassadors are therefore mediators between two parties. Because ambassadors don't just stay at home, they go. They go to where other people are. They speak their language. They learn the dialect. They learn the nuances of what it means to be that other person. So when they try to persuade them towards a certain point of view, they change how that other person is fundamentally but in their context, and in a way that that person would understand and relate to. And so we've been entrusted with the message as an ambassador, not just as people who go and proclaim the word to become saved, but people who build relationships with people. Not just in you know because we have to, but because we want to, because we care, because Jesus died for all, and therefore we go to all, no matter who they are, what they look like, or what they say about us because we're different, because we build relationship, because that's how we introduce people to reconciliation, is by getting to know people where they are and learning what they say. Once again, why it's so important why we hear what others say about us 
Because if we can learn their language and what they disagree with and what's hard for them to come across, it's easier for us to break down the walls to proclaim that message of reconciliation, to say to people, we know you're broken, you know you're broken, and this is the person who puts it back together again. And we can tell that story in a way that is relevant to them from our hearts, from who we are, and who God has intended us to be. And the verse 21, I think, is best explained by this. As an ambassador, we have to represent not just the message, but the image of the message. It says in verse 21 that God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And that's why it says in verse 20, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Because it's a pretty poor ambassador who has a message, but doesn't demonstrate it. Who has, you know, if the United States, if an ambassador goes over to a foreign country that isn't democratic, and they can't properly represent the unity that democracy is supposed to have, they can't promote American values by the way they live their life, by the way that they interact, someone's really likely to become like an American, to believe as they believe. And so when we promote the message, we can't just promote it as it is, but in who we are. And Paul is challenging us here to be reconciled each day, because even though Jesus has redeemed us, being reconciled is like sanctification, it's a process. I mean, I'll be honest, you're looking at a sinner up here, and if I can be blunt, I'm looking at a whole congregation of them too. Everybody here is a sinner, just like everybody outside is a sinner. And they have to be reconciled in the same way that we have to be. It takes time. It's a process. We'll never be exactly perfect, but every day God is reconciling us, fixing us, putting us back together, bringing us closer to Him. If we invest in the right things, and we listen to what He has to say, and we take part in what God is doing in the church, in the world around us, we become fixed. And this is what we're connecting people to. And we really have to demonstrate it. And there becomes a point where we have to become vulnerable in that. And I think that's part of what, it's a subtle point in this passage, but I do believe that Paul is saying this. Though we are promoting a message of reconciliation, we're also promoting a message of vulnerability. Because we're asking people to do what we're exactly doing. The fact that being reconciled isn't once and done, that it's a process. And that we're not saying this is immediate, you're getting saved, you're good, but that this takes time. And that because it's broken doesn't mean it's over. We just keep working and we work at it day after day until God finally makes us into what he wants us to be, an image of Christ. And that's what we have to portray to other people. Because Jesus showed his love for the whole world by dying on the cross for everyone. And because God loved us, if the love of God is in us, if we have love for God, we should love others in a way that Jesus did. <laughs> this is why the message is so important. We can't afford for it to be mixed. We can't afford for the message of reconciliation to be <clears throat> snapped in two by focusing too much on sin, on our perception, on others' perceptions of us. We have to focus on Jesus and look past everything. Our own agendas, ideas, thoughts. And we have to look at what Jesus wants us to do and to promote God's message as it is. And that doesn't mean that we deny truth. It doesn't mean we say to people, you know what, you don't like Jesus, you know, here's stuff I don't like about the church, whatever. It's fine to bond. And at some point we do have to say, you know what, sin is innocent. You know, we can't forever hold it against them. But at some point we do have to say, this is how it is. But how we say that very much matters. And so if you're a note taker, um, it's going to end with an application point. Um, I think there's something we can all take away from this this week. Just three simple steps to focusing on who Jesus is, what he did for us, promoting that to others in a way that is respectful. Um, and so my three-step challenge for this week uh, is just to remember that we were once and are sinners. If you're in Christ, we're, you know, we're still messed up. We're redeemed sinners, but we're sinners. And God's love is offered to us freely, and we can now live for others, not just to ourselves. And so the step is to thank God for loving us enough to reconcile us to him and to make us a partner in his ministry. Because that's what this is. This is a ministry of reconciliation. God has entrusted to us a message that we don't deserve, that he's given to us freely because of his sacrifice. 
And so we should thank him for giving us a chance to share that with other people. Uh, and because our worldview is supposed to change, uh, because we're sinners and Christ loved us, we can no longer hold sin against others who are not reconciled to him. And uh, not to be political about it, I'm not trying to go there at all, the world says we build walls, that we put up barriers between people, that we need to put up dividers. But it's our job to point to the bridge that is Jesus, that carries people from where they are now to where God is, and where God wants them to be. Um, and it's so important to start reframing the image of people around us, that we don't look at them as, you know, I don't look at Cindy as Cindy, but I see who Jesus wants Cindy to be. I don't see Bob as just Bob. I don't see my dad as just dad. Harvey as just Harvey. I see people as who God wants them to be. And so even people that I dislike or have an issue with, something that I strongly disagree with in their life, looking past that and seeing who they are. So I just challenge you, reframe the image of someone you dislike and start trying to see them as if Jesus' face was on them, as if this is who Jesus wants them to be. Because that's the starting point for building conversations, for turning people towards that. To stop seeing people in the way the world sees them, to stop acting like the world in that way, and in the sort of slurs and insults we may use, not even mean to. And I'm guilty of that as much as anybody else. I do it all the time, and probably beat myself up a little bit too much for it. But it's so important that we reframe, that we acknowledge what God's given us, thank Him for it, and reframe. And because the whole world is our mission field, we must take advantage of every opportunity we have to tell of the compelling truth and grace of Jesus Christ. So once again, we thank God for giving us this ministry. We reframe. And this is probably the simplest part of the challenge, though the most intimidating. Point someone you know to Jesus this week. I mean, raise your hand. Do you know somebody who's not Christian? We should all know somebody who isn't. Do you hang out with them on a regular basis? during the week, outside of work, maybe even during work. And the truth is, it's hard to point people to Jesus when we don't know them. But we all go, you go to a restaurant, you've got people there right near you. You have hostesses, you have the waitress. If you go shopping, there's people to talk to. There's always somebody that God puts in your path to share Jesus with. And it may be somebody you don't expect. So pray for and look for these opportunities, and then point somebody that God is calling you to talk to, to Jesus. Because it's a real shame if we have a message that is so powerful as this one is, and we do nothing with it. And I think that says more about our attitude towards other people if we don't share it. And I think that's the real crux of the whole passage, is that you know, no matter how we feel about others, this is what says who we are. If we are who we say we are, if we are who we are because of who Jesus is, then the message needs to go out. And I'll be honest, I'm not the best evangelist. There have been times it's been really awkward for me to talk with people who don't know Jesus, who I don't know, or even know personally. Um, but from the times that I have had those conversations that made me uncomfortable, they were the most rewarding spiritual conversations that I have ever had. Because I love to see what happens when somebody has a change of heart, not because of a truth that I just put out, but because of a relationship I built, and just taking the time to get to know somebody where they were, and to get to see how they change and become like Jesus, it's one of the most incredible things. Um, and the message that Jesus has given to all of us who are Christians, I'm just going to share that briefly again. Jesus sinless took on the weight of the whole world and accepted every sin from every person on this planet who has died and who will go before us He's extended his hand to us, and because of that, I extend the invitation again. I don't know if there's anybody in this audience who really doesn't know Jesus or has never experienced him in the way that he is. But I can tell you, by experiencing that power, it changes who you are, and it changes who God wants, you know, who, it changes you in the moment, and it changes you in the future. Uh, and it, once you experience the power of living in the Spirit and the restored relationship, everything is different. It's exactly like Paul says, the old has gone, the new has come. And the goal we should have this week is to be motivated towards others by the love of Christ, to proclaim God's repairing of the broken world the way it is.
No longer seeing the world just as the broken thing that is, but seeing where God can work in it to put it back together. And that's all I have for you today, so I'll go ahead and uh, close us out in prayer. If that's all right. Sorry, heads. Father, we come before you and we thank you for the sacrifice of Jesus. There are some things that are said about us in this world that you proclaim would happen, that the world would hate us. Uh, we know that it's so important that you've given us this message that we have to share it, that we have to get it right. And we don't want the world to hate us because of what we say, but because of you. Like you said, like you said in Scripture, that if the world hates us, it's because of you. And we desperately want to get the message out and to get it straight. And to change how we see the world, ourselves, and others, so that it can be brought back together, as you have intended for it to be, by dying on the cross. And we thank you for giving us this ministry, for giving us the imperative to reach out to others with loving arms and to bring them closer to you. Because we have experienced your grace, mercy, and power, and we want others to experience that as well. I thank you for this church. I thank you for the willing hearts out here who serve um, and for their desire to come closer to you and to grow in you every day. And it's in Jesus' precious name that I pray. We get to offer a song of invitation. Now have everybody stand. I'm going to sing this without a few minutes, so I don't want to sing it right now. <coughs> but mostly, uh, do look at the words. And, um, it's one of my favorite songs anyway. And if you feel the need to walk up front, um, we definitely have people that can hear if you, if you decide that um, you need something that's pulling you towards uh, the Lord. This is the best time um, with the best church family that I know of that can uh, put your arms around you and, and make you feel comfortable. Um, I, I thank Steve for um, giving that out, I and mean, one thing I, I took out of that too is, is the relationships that we build. And if you're being Christ like, then his relationship will shine through. I'll just start with the note. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. Yeah.